Welcome and good evening. Today is Good Friday and you have uh, found Church in the Canyons uh, YouTube channel and this is our service where we celebrate uh, the year 2020's Good Friday when we recognize that Christ died for us. Uh, for those of you who are sheltering in place and still at home, stay there, be smart, be safe. Uh, those of you who are working in essential jobs, I pray that you are safe and we are uh, remembering all of you in our prayers. A couple of announcements. First, I want to recommend to you, if some of you have tried to support the church and its work by going online, I heard from Connie this week that we don't, you can't give by clicking directly online, but you can get information on an app that you download. All of this technology is a little new for me. Uh, I ought to know better, but, uh, but I don't use apps like this. So um, you can go and get that app, and then you can give that way. If you have any questions, feel free to call the church office at 818-880-2060 and someone will get back to you probably within a couple days we're excuse me <coughs> we're trying to stay uh, we're working remotely these days as many people are across the country I also want to share with you guys a neat idea that I got in calling different folks in the congregation and finding out how they're doing it's interesting that the number one uh, thing that people say is that they're bored. Everyone's going a little stir crazy. But I got a great idea when I was talking to Bert Vigil and he gave credit to his mom Dora. So Dora, thank you for this idea. You know, we're told to wash our hands now very religiously and somebody shared with them the idea that when you're washing your hands, say the the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name and just go st and then by the time you're done saying that prayer, you'll have spent enough time washing your hands to be completely disinfected. Anyway, great tip. Thanks, Bert. And uh, be encouraged, folks. I know this seems like a long time, and it seems like, you know, this uh, quarantine is never going to end. Is it going to end in May? Is it going to end in June? I saw someone talking about 18 months, and I just turned the news channel off. I didn't want to hear any more of that. Um, whatever does happen, God is still in control, and everything's going to be okay. Um, and if things aren't good yet, it just means that we haven't reached the end yet. Uh, there is a good ending to all these things, and that's one of the things Good Friday and Easter Sunday are all about. This morning, our call to worship is a very familiar uh, text of the Bible. It is the Shepherd's Psalm, Psalm 23. Trouble with tunnel vision is I can't figure out where the numbers are on my page here. I should have had my finger there. Here we go. Found it. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that... Uh, in one day of the year, uh, during the week of Passover, on Good Friday, we remember the fact that Christ, our Savior, the Son of God from all eternity, died in our place and gave his life in exchange for, uh, for ours. And Almighty God, we pray that you would help us to remember that during this uh, short hour that we spend together here. Father, we pray that you would draw near to us as we uh, draw near to you by your Spirit. Lord, speak to us in the uh, reading of your word, and Lord, we pray that you would be with us and uh, hear our prayers and our praises as we may be singing at home tonight as well. Father, we pray all of these things, thanking you for the goodness and grace that are ours in Christ. Amen. So these worship services conducted virtually with me looking at that little camera and you guys sitting around your tables and on your sofas and in your different homes around uh, these valleys we live in here in California. It's been a bit of a challenge. Uh, liturgically, everything's all askew. We don't have singing. We don't have uh, the pastoral prayer. We don't have things like the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, which ordinarily we'd be celebrating tonight. A lot of churches are doing that. 
we're not going to do that tonight. And some of you might say, well, why not? And in, in fact, a couple of you have called and emailed and, and made recommendations to the effect that, hey, this is what we could do. And a lot of churches are doing that, and more power to them. I have no intention of saying anything that should be interpreted as a critique of that at all. But having said that, I'll tell you why we are not going to celebrate the Lord's Supper remotely. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we read that, G, uh, that the Apostle Paul is replying to certain issues that came up in the church in Corinth. And so you'll see, now for the matters you wrote about, about this, about that, and about this, and different subjects come up as you read through 1 Corinthians. And when Paul starts to talk about now, about your meetings when you come together as the church, that's the context for everything he says about the Lord's Supper. When we meet together as the church, and the whole point is some aren't waiting for others. Some are going ahead and eating at their own pace. Some are doing it their time, their way. And it is no longer that communal event in which they are all partaking at the same time in the same place. Uh, and that's important. We live in a day and an age when more and more things are becoming virtual. We see that even in education. You know, my kids that are still in school, they are taking their courses virtually now, finishing up their... Uh, their education for the school year and they're not all doing it at the same time one kid is taking their third period class at two in the afternoon and another's downloading it and doing his part just as long as they submit their homework by midnight on the next day and everything is becoming sort of uh, on-demand delivery style uh, approach to things more and more things are do at your own pace do at your own convenience do whenever you're able to in fact Many of us are going to be listening to this Good Friday service and participating audibly or, or uh, listening to it and participating uh, in spirit, if you will, uh, well after 7 o'clock on Friday. And if there's an invitation to the Lord's Supper, that's going to be celebrated all over the place, all kinds of different times, not just separated by space, but separated by time, such that it loses something of the dynamic of a communal event. For sure, there's ways around that. But some things you don't do virtually. Uh, this summer, I have two weddings planned that I'll be officiating at. I'm very happy with my one wedding. Uh, and both of them are postponed. Why? Because some things you just don't do virtually. Memorial services being delayed till people can actually fly together and be together, not being done by Zoom or Skype or uh, you know, Google Meetup or any other thing like that. Could be done that way, but not being done that way. Some things are that important. And I want to encourage you to think that the very first Sunday that we meet together as a church, that very first Sunday, I don't care if it's the second Sunday, the third, the fourth, whatever Sunday of the month it is, we're celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And until then, be hungry for it, anticipate it, long for it, wait for it, prepare for it by repentance and faith by trusting in Christ, and by looking to him even in this time of difficulty. Speaking of times of difficulty, Good Friday is a time when we remember what was surely the most difficult day of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's uh, earthly ministry, the day that he was betrayed by one of his closest friends. Judas Iscariot uh, Iscariot, some people think it had to do with the fact that he might have had reddish coloration in his hair. I, as a redhead, I don't think that's true. Most redheads are decent, upright fellows. But more credible than that is the fact that he's Judas of Iscariot, Iscariot being a town in Judah. Much more common, much more sensible. And if that is the case, which I suspect that it is, Judas would be the only of the twelve disciples who was himself of the tribe of Judah, the closest kinsman, the one who had the most affinity with Christ by birth, and he's the one who betrayed him. That's a bad day in a man's life, to be betrayed by a close friend. As the Son of God, he knew exactly what enduring the wrath of his heavenly Father on the cross in the place of sinners would be. And so in the Garden of Gethsemane, as after he's been betrayed, after Judas has left that Last Supper, and he's crossed the brook of the Kidron Valley and ascended the slopes uh, to, on the Mount of Olives to go to that garden, 
he weeps and he sweats and he cries out to God, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours. So there's a sense in which this is a bad day in the life of Jesus, a hard day, a day of shadows and tears, a day of crying, a day of betrayal, a day of arrest, a day of rejection. And it leads to the morning of the trial, of carrying the cross, being whipped, and ultimately of being crucified. It was a day of suffering, and it's described with that exact word when we look at what Peter, one of the twelve, says in chapter 3, verse 18 of First Peter. And that is our text for today. If you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to First Peter, chapter 3, verse 18. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And Lord, we do. Uh, just, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be grateful for everything you're doing in our life on every day. Lord, help us never to take a single day for granted, but always to look for how you are blessing us and how you would use us to be a blessing. And Father, as we read this text of Scripture, Lord, we pray that you would help us to understand something of the death of Christ for us that much better that we can live in a way that brings you glory and honor and truly blesses, spiritually advances the cause and the condition of all of those around us whose lives we share and who we, by your grace and goodness, love. We ask this blessing in Christ's name. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. This ends the reading of God's Word. Typically, pastors, and typically I myself, when it comes to Good Friday, preach from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and we look at the events of that last day, whether it's the Last Supper, or the time in Garden of Gethsemane, or the time on the cross. This year I've chosen to take this text because suffering seems to be the context of all of our lives right now, one way or another. It might be sort of the soft suffering of being uh, stuck in our houses, right, where we're uh, wearing our pajamas until noon, um, answering the telephone. Uh, we haven't even combed our hair yet. You know, some of us are living that life and rocking it. Others of us have a, more of a hard experience of the suffering. Maybe someone in your family is sick. Maybe you've lost someone already received an email today from a brother pastor right here in L.A. who lost a member of his congregation uh, to COVID-19. And uh, it's, it's going to be everywhere. If it's not where you are now, it will be soon enough. And so there is a lot of suffering in the world around us. And one of the things that I love about the Bible, and I've loved this about the Bible since I was a very young man, a teenager, the Bible's true to life. The Bible doesn't sugarcoat anything. The Bible gives us true statements about a real world. The Bible doesn't deny the difficulty of life, the bloodiness or the, the horrendous uh, ugliness and brutality of sin. It doesn't deny anything about the human condition that we might otherwise want to downplay or to dress up a little bit. We have this phrase that's crept into the English language where we talk about looking at things through rose-colored uh, glasses. And that comes from an older English expression, he paints a rose-colored uh, picture. And if you go back into the experience of the Middle Ages, of the, the plagues, those epidemics, the Black Death, uh, that come along and wipe out a third of society, and some entire hamlets get reduced to nothing. And a lot of the artwork from that time, from the high Middle Ages, late Middle Ages, even into the early modern period, you'll notice there's lots of skeletons. Have you ever noticed that? Lots of skeletons. But look at those pictures. And one of the things you'll notice about those pictures is even though they're displaying life, sometimes everyday life with its surrounding uh, reality of death in the form of dancing skeletons or skulls in the corner or in, in just bizarre ways death is being interjected into every pastoral scene you can imagine and you think this is weird I'll tell you what's weirder the fact that the artist as if to cheer the scene up would paint roses with bright red colors in all the corners too 
Very strange. Very strange. As if we're trying to follow the advice of the sound of music and give that spoonful of sugar to make the medicine go down. And you know, when it comes to suffering, the brutality of life, if you will, the fact that death is a reality, that disease is real, that conditions that involve significant heartache and loneliness and uh, bereavement are a part of our existence, those facts can't be sweetened with a couple of flowers or an artificial sweetener. And nor does the Bible make the effort. The Son of God himself weeps. He weeps. He weeps at the thought of his own death. He weeps at his friend Lazarus's death. He cries out when he sees what has become of Jerusalem on that last holy week when he tops the rise on the road from Jericho and sees the city he has loved. Suffering is real. Peter knows suffering well. Peter talks about suffering in 1 Peter, and he tells us later, don't be surprised at the trials you're suffering as if something strange is happening to you. Suffering is a theme throughout this entire, entire letter. and In this chapter, chapter 3, Paul is talking about the suffering that can take place even in a marriage, even in a, a husband and wife who go through betrothal and engagement and marriage and kids and there's suffering sometimes. There's fighting, there's pain, there's turmoil. And the Apostle Peter is in this context encouraging people, hey, think about suffering this way. Think about suffering this way. If you're going to suffer, suffer for doing what is good. Always seek to do what honors God and blesses others. And it's in this context that he says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. See, ultimately, it's about Good Friday. We should very deliberately and intentionally connect our suffering to the suffering of Christ on the cross. Our suffering is connected to the suffering of Christ for us when he was put to death once for all for the sins of the unrighteous. Now, I want you to think about these days we're in and the suffering that we're experiencing that might be at the front of most of our minds is related to the coronavirus. It's causing a lot of suffering. You know, I love the kids that I coach very much. And, uh, you know, some of the seniors that are on the team this year, I've known them since they were in sixth grade. I've known them for seven years. I have watched them and fostered some elements of their character and mentored them and trained them up in the ways of lacrosse player and in some ways of a man. And I've seen some of those guys working hard so that they could play at the next level or working for that elusive but sometimes attainable goal of being an All-American their senior year. And we have All-Americans at Oak Park High School. Every year or two we have one and sometimes we have two. And uh, that's a thrill. But this year, no one's going to be All-American. In fact, this year, no one gets a prom. This year, they're not going to get a graduation service. This year, all of their hard work in this last great year that most of them will get to play the game, it's just gone. They're suffering. Why? Because of coronavirus. It shut everything down. And that's just kids that are seniors in high school. Think about others. I have a, an acquaintance who lost a mother. And they're not even able to grieve properly. Family can't gather together to console each other with anything but virtual hugs. So they're simply not the same. There's all kinds of suffering. And when we think about suffering, and we think about the coronavirus, we think about, well, how can we try to resolve this coronavirus? The couple of things we really want to know are, well, wh where did it come from? What, what's, what's the cause of it? And, and secondly, well, what's the cure of it? You know, find the cause of it. You might be able to figure things out about its transmission. Find the cure of it, and you can put an end to its tyranny. Now, whether the cause of coronavirus is wet markets or a science lab, uh, I don't know. I don't pretend to know, and from my perspective, doesn't matter that much to me. But I do know what the cause of our suffering is, more generally speaking. We read that Jesus suffered once for sin. It's interesting that it doesn't say he died once for sin. 
Our text in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Jesus suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. It's only later we find out that that suffering involved his dying, his death in the flesh. Now, all suffering is connected to sin. You go back in the introduction of sin in the human experience. It's described for us in really horrific detail in Genesis chapter 3. Our first father and mother, Adam and Eve, are in the Garden of Eden. They were given one rule. They had one job, right? One job. Eat whatever you want, any of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden, but not that one. And, of course, that's what they chose to do. They were deceived by Satan, and Eve ate, then Adam ate. And God approaches them and says, where are you, Adam? And Adam's hiding because he's naked and ashamed. He's afraid and he's hiding. And he, God says, well, who told you you were, you, you were naked? And he says, well, uh, the confession comes out. He ate from the fruit of the tree. He blames it on Eve. He blames it on Satan. And so God turns and in a horrific twist for human uh, kind, Ever since, he curses Satan, he curses Eve, and he curses Adam. And in those curses, three things are really cursed with suffering. First, relationships are cursed. The woman will desire the man, but he will rule over her. There is a sense in which all of our relational dysfunctions, every species and variety of all of our disconnects, misunderstandings, dislikes, discuss all of that, traces back to that. Keep in mind, at this point in biblical history, there's two people, Adam and Eve. And God is saying that relationship will no longer proceed in sweet, unbroken harmony. Now, there's going to be conflict. Relationships are now in the world of suffering. So is your health. The New Testament teaches us that the wages of sin is death. And that is a lesson that was taught in Genesis chapter 2. We read that God said, For in the day you eat of that tree, you will surely die. And our physical death was guaranteed with all of that means, our mortality, the fact that we are now subject to decay, the fact that we now will get diseases, we will get illnesses, we will get headaches, we will get sore throats, we will, we're going to die, folks, one per customer. We now suffer in our bodies because of sin. And lastly, I would say professionally. God tells Adam, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat the bread of your labor. The ground will produce for you rocks and thorns. In an agrarian culture, that's pretty much all of your occupations. But it's still the same way for us. We eat by the sweat of our brow. And I don't care how good a job we have, how much we like it, whether it's a calling or a vocation or just a burden we bear, there are rocks and thorns, and we suffer. As I was preparing my message notes for this Good Friday service, I was thinking, well, is there any other kind of suffering? We suffer in our bodies, we suffer in our relationships, we suffer in our professions, and, you know, perhaps you're more creative than I am, but I could find a way to fit every form of suffering I experienced in one of those categories. Uh, the fear of death, certainly, those psychological fears I would associate with physical decay and dying, and uh, basically sin is the bad actor in the human experience that has been that proverbial fly in the ointment which ruins it all. And if we could only get rid of sin, we could put an end to suffering. Well, the trouble is we can't put an end to sin. There's nothing we can do to make up for sins in the past. We can't hardly keep ourselves from sinning in the present. And each of you will sin tomorrow unless the Lord comes for you and you're translated into glory. Sin is a part of our life. Therefore, suffering is as well. But what we read in First Corinthians, and pardon me, in First Peter, chapter three, verse eighteen, is that Jesus 
suffered for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous. You see, Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty for those sins. Earlier I cited a text from Romans that says the wages of sin is death. That verse goes on. But the free gift of God is eternal life. In 1 Corinthians we read this text. For God made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus Christ, the sinless one, to be sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God. So here's the picture. Jesus Christ himself, he comes and he suffers in our place for the sins we committed. He pays the penalty for our sins that we might be the righteousness of God. What does that mean? What does it mean to be the righteousness of God? Well, the only one who can truly be called righteous in their own right by their own merit is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And imagine, if you will, that uh, I have two baseball cards, or uh, baseball's coming up. It should be going now. I heard a rumor that they're going to try to start the season up with one location and all the rest, but we'll see about that. But imagine for now that there's two baseball cards, and one has your picture on it, and one has the picture of Jesus Christ. And the baseball card with your picture on it has your spiritual stats, if you will. And here's your spiritual stats. Uh, the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, I've had a lot of gods before the living God. I've, you know, I had my, uh, I've, I've worshipped my career. I've worshipped pleasure. I've worshipped money. I have made idols out of X, Y, and Z. Everything from fishing to lacrosse to my theology book collection. All of these things I've made idols. So, oh my goodness, I'm not very good there. So, I'll, okay, that's a, may, maybe I'm uh, one for ten. Maybe. Well, let's talk about the next one. Let's skip down to honor thy father and mother. That's the fifth commandment. How did you do on that one, Bjerkis? Well, got a lot of spankings as a kid. Probably deserve a lot as an adult. Uh, maybe let's move on to another one. Well, you go down those commandments and you find that, lo and behold, you're a pretty sinful person. Lo and behold... If you were to be drafted on some team of spiritual giants uh, based upon your statistics, you're not going to make that cut. No one is. Because God is holy, utterly perfect. And in his perfection, he must and he, he cannot look past sin. It must be dealt with. So much for your card. It's awful. My card, it's awful. It's an embarrassment. I would shudder to think that sort of uh, scrolling beside my head here on this uh, computer screen you're looking at would be a list of every thought I've ever had. It'd be mortifying. I'd never go out in public again. No doubt you're the same. Now think about the card of Jesus Christ. Perfectly kept every single commandment. Not one single sin. The spotless Lamb of God. Now when Jesus Christ suffered for sins the righteous for the unrighteous. And when he offers himself to us by inviting us and commanding us to come to him with repentance and faith, I want you to imagine those two baseball cards and imagine the script on the back of those cards flipping where Jesus basically says, I am going to take the blame and the punishment for all of your failures and I'm going to give you the credit and the reward for all of my obedience. You see, it's a two-way exchange. Your sin and guilt get laid on Christ. Christ's obedience gets credited to you so that when God the Father looks on us in our standing by faith in Christ, he sees the very righteousness of God. That should humble us to our core. That should make us be grieved by our own sins all the more. We can't think of a word offensive enough for sin if we think of how sweet and precious that righteousness of God is to us. Jesus suffered for sins once, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we might be brought near to God. The cause of sin, the cause of suffering is sin. The cure for suffering is Jesus who brings us near to God. 
And I want to invite you to consider this Good Friday that when Jesus died, he didn't just die to eliminate the cause of your problems. He did that. He did that. Our problems now are temporary. They are short and temporary and not very heavy at all compared to the, the glories of heaven that awaits. The reward of Christ which he offers to his people. But when Jesus Christ suffered for sin, he also is doing something that brings us an unspeakable blessing. You see, he dies in the flesh, and he truly did come in the flesh, and he truly died on that cross. But he is raised by the Spirit. And there is a sense in which that victory over sin that is accomplished in his death and in his resurrection that we'll be remembering on Sunday morning is something that points us to the ultimate cure of the human solution. We're in an election cycle now, and some of us are so foolish as to think one more time that if only we elect the right politician, culture will be fixed. Well, newsflash, friends, it won't be. There will still be people in charge, and as long as people are in charge, we are basically all on a train that's uh, wandering around the wilderness looking for the tracks, ready to wreck at any moment. Uh, however, God has a plan and a purpose in all things. And his plan and purpose don't simply go from market cycle to market cycle. His plan and his purpose go into eternity as far as the imagination can extend. And I want you to think about that as you suffer. Whether it's the soft suffering of sheltering at home and trying to work from your laptop on a sticky kitchen table after you just had too much syrup on your waffles, or whether it's a hard suffering where people are dying and you're sick and friends you know are in the hospital and you can't visit them, whatever the kind of suffering you're experiencing might be, I want to encourage you to think that Christ suffered too. In the flesh, he truly suffered. The righteous for the unrighteous on account of our sins that we might be brought near to God. And the cure to your suffering is being brought near to God. Some of you feel like you're far from God. And if that's the case with you, I want to encourage you to think of some advice that I heard uh, secondhand from an old, old Norwegian farmer in Minnesota. He said, if you're thirsty, go to the last place you had a drink of water. There's probably a spigot nearby. I want you to think about the times you felt close to God. And I bet you you were probably reading your Bible, or someone was reading it to you, or you were praying. You were probably going to church or participating in some Bible study, maybe in a small group. You probably weren't caught in the trap of some addiction or sin. And if you want to be near to God, Take advantage of the fact that Jesus Christ, through the preaching of his word, whether it's done via YouTube or in a brick-and-mortar building, he says to people like you and me, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. You see, Christ has opened up the way. He suffered for those sins that make you so far away. Turn, repent, same word, exact same word, turn and repent, absolutely the same word in the Old Testament language. Turn around. Only look to this one who died on Good Friday to pay the penalty for your sins, who suffered in his flesh for you, that you might be brought near to your God. And draw near to him. Some of you are Christians and you're far away from God. And you're so caught up in yourselves and your plans and your hopes and worldly things that you can hardly spare a thought for heaven all of your decisions are made based on the same decisions that govern Hollywood, Wall Street, and Madison Avenue. I would invite you to draw near to God and look at things through the eye of the Spirit of the living God who sees righteousness and unrighteousness, heaven and hell, obedience and faith, repentance, sanctification, holiness. You see, these are the categories that matter. These are the words that must define us and help us describe our experiences. Draw near to God in your suffering. 
come back to church. Whether that means tuning in regularly or whether that means praying with us for this quarantine to end so we can get back together at 1045 or 11 or whenever your church service begins. And pray. I invite you to pray the way I'm going to lead us in prayer right now. So join me, won't you? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we confess that we are suffering. We're suffering all the effects of the little deaths all around us. The death of our plans, the death of our hopes, the death of our lacrosse seasons, the death of our high school careers, the death of our uh, companies as they're going under, the death of all sorts of things we're experiencing right now. Some of us are experiencing the death of loved ones. Maybe in our own families, spouses, parents, kids. Father, in all of this, help us to think of the suffering of Christ for us. Lord Jesus Christ, help us remember that your suffering for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that we might be brought near, brought near to God, was done so that the poison and the bitterness and the fangs of death might be once and for all broken off and nullified that there might be a victory over the grave and all the suffering that we experience. Almighty God, hear our prayers as we come to you and confess that we are sinners. We are sinners and we deserve every bit of punishment and suffering that sinners deserve, and that's more than we can imagine. But Lord Jesus, we thank you that you, the Son of God from all eternity, became flesh for us and suffered in our place in every way made like us, and then died for sinners like us. Such a terrible death. That the wrath of a holy God might be once and for all satisfied, and that we might be credited that perfect righteousness of the sweet Savior. And help us, O oh God, as Christians, to live in that and grow in it. Forgive us for being such ham-fisted, dull-minded folk, and help us to walk in step with your Spirit. Help us, O oh God, not just simply to be Good Friday Christians trusting in his death for us, but help us to be Easter Christians as well who are walking in the power of a resurrection, who are walking by the Spirit according to the Word, who are seeing things through the life of the Son of God. We pray all of these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. And to all of you, I would say good night. Have a blessed remainder of your Good Friday, and just remember, Easter's coming. See you on Sunday. Good night.